Okay, everybody, let's go ahead and talk about making fortified wines, one of my favorite things in the world to do. Okay, let's talk about the tasting setup. So get out your uh, six tubes and then your bottle of tawny. And the first one, I want you to put the tube that's labeled SVR. And then the second glass, I want you to put in the brandy, which is the brown one. And then after that, uh, you do the, the tubes labeled 16, 17, 18, and 19. And then pour yourself a drab of the tawny to finish it up. So fortification, why would you do this? Well, fortification historically is done to make wine naturally sweet. The goal all throughout history was to have sweet wines. Um, and we didn't really know how to do it. And uh, if you look at the history of it, the Dutch were really the first people to kind of master it and export it. But it was the French that figured out how to do it back in the 1100s. But we always wanted sweet wines. Um, botrytized wines that got high enough in sugar and then they had the toxic capacity of the, the, the mold, the botrytis on there would stop those ferments sweet. And those are the most highly prized wines in the world. S dry wines didn't take over as the dominant uh, consumed wine in the world until the 1960s. Uh, in the U.S., we consumed more fortified wines until 1967. That was the year that it switched. And we were drinking sweet, high alcohol, fortified wines up until recently. And you think about the reason for, uh, for that, it's because the we didn't have good refrigeration. We didn't have good shipping. We didn't have anything else to do that. So when you fortified wine, you made it tougher. And fortified wines are really robust. They can handle anything. And I think you're going to see an example of that in this tasting that, you know, these wines are almost impossible to destroy. So if you want to make natural wines, you want to make wines that have very little impact or uh, added things, uh, this is the way to go because you can run pretty low SO2 or no SO2 because you don't need an antimicrobial anymore. You got the alcohol. And uh, the sugar content also reacts as an antioxidant. So these wines are really, really durable. Um, so the thing is, as we have to talk about is, so when do we fortify? Where are our decisions uh, in this? So the timing is a bit of a challenge. So the liqueur style, which is a little closer to what they do in Australia and a little bit closer to our Barbera, our Barbera is kind of a bit of a hybrid, but a liqueur, um, which is they make in, in Italy, they just basically get the sugar up high enough and they add the alcohol directly. So you add enough alcohol to get the content up to 18% alcohol. That's it. Um, and that can be done on skins or off skins. Um, and it really makes a very, you know, sweet style, very grapey style of wine. Port styles are a little bit different because when you look at port, port wines, they're fermented out quite a bit. And the, the reason for that is, too, is if you're making a liqueur, spirits are expensive. We're talking $40 or $50 a gallon. And uh, you're adding, you know, a, a huge amount of that to your wine. So your wine could be, you know, made up of 25% spirit, um, you know, if it's a, a pot still brandy. And so that makes it really expensive to produce. So if you can ferment out a little bit, the yeast will make their own natural, uh, you know, alcohol. Some people that make fortified wines, if they can't get it to like, they get a 22, 23 bricks, they'll add sugar uh, to the fermentation to get natural alcohol because, because sugar is way cheaper. Um, and then they'll arrest the fermentation with alcohol. But one thing I want to tell you over and over again, and I see winemakers do this, and there's a reason there's a rash of really bad port out there, is people have wine that goes pear-shaped. It goes bad. And so they think they can just add some alcohol and add some sugar to it and make a really nice fortified wine. That's not the case. You have to arrest that fermentation to get all those flavors just right. Um, so port-style wines, how, you know, when do you pick, when do you do it? Well, it's challenging. You've got to decide when you're going to do it. So generally fortified wines, uh, port style, are around uh, 8 to 10% uh, residual sugar, whereas uh, our, our Barbera liqueur is a little closer to 18 to 20% sugar. So quite a bit sweeter in terms of style. Um, and then sherries can even be dry, and they just fortify that, that dry white wine uh, made from the Palomino grape, and they take that up to maybe, oh... 16% alcohol, so there can be dry sherries. And then uh, Madeira is a whole other uh, animal. Those are quite sweet. Those are closer to a liqueur, but they're, they're cooked in a stupidrum. And then uh, Vindu Natural is the original, and that's uh, the, the sweet natural wine. And that's um, uh, the, the French have been doing that for about a thousand years now. So um, we've been doing it for a long time, primarily to make wine stable and shippable. But the challenges are there and when you're going to fortify so the biggest issue is obscuration. So hydrometers can be uh, used to measure the content of sugar. And I want to talk about uh, doing it in Bome. I need to talk about Bome. And there, there's a reason that we were talking about Bome here in a second. 
but um, it's a little different. That measures the potential alcohol of a, a, a wine. So uh, sugar solutions that have higher specific gravity than pure water, um, the specific gravities of these solutions are always greater than one. However, if a must is fermenting, alcohol is going to be present. Alcohol solutions always have a lower specific gravity than water, uh, which is why when you get a uh, fermentation dry, if people say it's dry, it's at negative one, negative two. That's because you've got alcohol in solution, so that hydrometer is going to sink a little further. So if you're trying to laser in a, a residual sugar using a hydrometer, it's pretty tough for a densitometer. Uh, because you're just measuring the gravity, you're just measuring the weight. It doesn't really tell you anything. So if you want to get really accurate with your sugars, you either need to measure enzymatically or you need to calculate the obscuration. So here's how you calculate obscuration. Um, what you need to do is your, your Bome, and Bome is bricks uh, divided by 1.8, and Bome is just your potential alcohol. Um, and they use this in most countries. They pick on Bome. Uh, we're one of the only ones that uses bricks. Uh, most of France and most of Australia and South Africa uh, use Bome. So you pick your wine at 14 Bome because it would be potentially 14% alcohol. Um, and uh, it's a different way of approaching um, uh, winemaking. Uh, so, and then in, in like Germany, they'll use Oschle, which is a whole other thing. But let's just focus on Bome uh, because this makes life a lot easier because then you're just measuring in potential alcohol units. And that way, when you're adding, you're adding potential alcohol units. So here's how you calculate Bome. Uh, and then here's how you would uh, calculate that uh, obscuration, uh, which is every 1% of alcohol, you go off by 0.26 Bome. So uh, if you had a wine that was 18% alcohol and the hydrometer said it was a 4.7 Bome, and you actually measured that uh, in terms of Bome, you'd be at 7.7 .7 Bome, which is quite a bit of sugar. You're talking about 11 or 12 percent uh, sugar, so it's quite a bit. Um, so if you were to, to do that, then you can perform a Pearson square. I uh, put up another video on how to do a Pearson square. I'll show you the, the, the math here, but it's pretty hard to explain math in a YouTube video, if not impossible. There's other people that are much better at it than me. I don't have the technology to do it, but um, I'll show you how to do it. But just look at that how-to video uh, in the calculator that I've posted up for you. So when are you going to fortify? How long is a piece of string? Just depends on your style. What are you going for? How do you want it to be? Uh, how long do you want that wine to be able to, to last? You know, what are, what are your goals with that wine? Um, and so we have to know what our starting Bome and why we're using Bome is just that potential alcohol because it, then we're working all in the same units. We're working in potential alcohol units. So pretty cool um, uh, way to go. So this is the way you would set it up, but go ahead and take a look at that uh, calculator. It'll help a lot. So. That brings us to the spirits. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of grape spirit out there. Um, and so every your spirit, because it's going to make up a very significant portion of your, um, uh, your, your final wine, you've got to make sure that it's going to be contributing exactly what you want. So it depends on the starting varietal uh, and winemaking practices, uh, because all those things are going to influence things called congeners. And I'll talk about congeners in a second. So it also depends on when it was cut. Did you let a lot of the heads come over and is it going to be really floral? So the first part of the distillation run tends to have all the aldehydes and all the esters and things like that. So it's very, very floral. But as you get further and further down the road in distillation uh, and you're, you're cooking it hotter and hotter and hotter, um, the things called fusel oils start coming up. And now realize wine has 30 different alcohols, 30 of them that we know of in wine. And so the first ones that come off might be like methanol. And then those are high floral sweet styles of alcohol. Not that you want to drink methanol, but if it's diluted into wine, it's fine. Um, and then as you get further down the ra rails, you end up getting into these tails uh, cuts. And these tails cuts uh, have things like propanol and butanol, and they're uh, really heavy uh, alcohols. And they uh, have a kind of sweaty saddle aroma. And those ones are called uh, fat spirits because they kind of smell and taste fatty. So, and it would depend on what style you want to do. And I've got some different styles uh, to taste here in a bit with different types. So the other things that's going to depend on is how was it distilled? Was it in a pot still, a single pass pot still, the shape of the pot, or is it a reflex or con uh, continuous still? So let me, let me take you through what those So your first glass uh, is a SVR, and this is uh, uh, that glass. You can give it a sniff. Uh, if you want to taste this, I recommend you water it back about 30% because you're at 95% pure spirit. Um, so in this case, what we have is we have uh, this, uh, basically we're, we're sending in uh, 
you know, wine into a steam bath where there's different bubble caps all the way up. And then you can extract pure spirit out at a very strong, uh, you know, level. And, and we cleared out all the other stuff. But if you notice in this particular case, what we see is the heads, all that floral stuff goes out the top and it goes away. And then they'll, they might clean that up and extract some more alcohol out of it. And then the tails go down the drain. So those fusel oils go down the drain and you're taking out pure ethanol. So it's really pure, clean ethanol. Spiritus Venom Rectificatum, which means rectified grape spirits. Uh, that means it's really, really clean. Um, and so it lacks any things called congeners. I'm going to talk about congeners are in a second. And so when you're using SVR, it's for a wine you're going to turn out really, really quick. And realize MD2020, even though we kind of gig about, giggle about it now, and it's from a you know, website called Bum Wine, um, it was the standard. It was drinking Night Train and MD2020 and high alcohol wines. Um, that was really the nature of the beast back in the day. Um, so, so these wines integrate really quickly. So when you're adding pure SBR, you don't have anything to, to get in the way of that, that spirit going in and integrating in the wine. And when you fortify your wine for the first time, you are gonna freak out and think you screwed up everything. Because when you pitch that first batch of spirits in, you're gonna taste your wine and it's gonna taste like it's 50% alcohol. The alcohol sits on top of the wine, it doesn't integrate, and it tastes terrible. But when you actually go measure it, you'll find out you're only at 14 or 15%. Uh, and then you'll have to probably add more spirits. So it's really shocking. But uh, if you use SVR, you can have a wine that you can have turned out in under a year and have really good integrated uh, flavor. Uh, so it does impact very significantly what you're going to do. So if you're looking for a quick ruby port or maybe a white port style wine, I keep using port, I should say fortified wine, dessert style wine, um, it's really, really important to uh, use SVR because those are going to get right into the into the, the wine and then you'll have something that you can turn out really, really quickly. But it makes a very simple beverage. It's just going to taste like grapes and alcohol. It doesn't taste like anything else. Really, really simple, really, really clean, but it's, it's a really good way to turn things out quickly. So let's talk about brandy distillation. So this is old school. So this is a very different way to do it. Pot still maxes out at about 80% alcohol. And what a pot still is, is literally a pot. You can make one of these out of a pot in your kitchen uh, in some tubing. It's that simple. So um, we want to talk about a few different things. So what we do is in a, uh, a, a pot still, we slowly warm it up and we slowly fracture that wine. And, and distillation is the process of fracturing a wine through uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a liquid separation process driven by heat. And so we heat up the wine and things in the wine have different boiling points. That means they want to leave the wine at different temperatures. Now there's a lot of compounds in wine. Let's talk about a few of them. We have acetaldehyde that basically boils at room temperature. Then we have methanol that comes off next. Then we have ethanol that comes off next, uh, which is what we're really looking to try and get is that ethanol piece. And we talk about the heads cut. The heads cut has that methanol and acetaldehyde piece, and then we get to the, the pure ethanol piece. And then as we get hotter and hotter, like things like propanol and butanol, which are heavy alcohols, those are those fusel oils, they come off. But the, the fact of the matter is in this, is that this is a very complex spirit. There are thousands of different aromas that come over in this distillation process. There's a lot of different flavors. So there's a lot of different other things that come over. And as a matter of fact, sulfides will come over in the distillation process. And the reason I put this here is that you'll notice that most stills are made out of copper. And there's a reason for that, is that that binds uh, up all the, the sulfides. And as a matter of fact, I recommend if you do uh, ever do start finding yourself distilling wine, um, make sure to add a fair whack of um, hydrogen peroxide to your uh, distillation run for wine. The peroxide will immediately uh, bind up all the SO2. It also has a very high boiling point. Um, it's like 220 degrees or something like that Fahrenheit. So it's well above or 110 centigrade. So it's quite high. And so it doesn't break down very easily. But what happens is as soon as you start boiling it, uh, it will bind up any of the SO2 and it'll make your still last a lot longer. So, uh, you know, add plenty of peroxide. And then another thing to add is uh, some, some copper or copper sulfate crystals to the, uh, to the wash itself because that will help extend the life of your, uh, your still. 
Uh, so adding that copper sulfate will turn uh, those copper uh, complexes into something soluble that'll settle to the bottom of the still. So important notes if you ever do find yourself getting into distillation, something I think we're going to kind of miss out on this year, but uh, say la vie. Some, some point in time, we'll do a distillation uh, lab. So the point of pot still and the reason why we have this, and this is actually a bottle of my wine. I do have the 1909 Para, It was in barrels for 100 years. Um, and if you go to Seppel's Field, I highly recommend, uh, if you ever get to Australia, going to Seppel's Field, it'll blow your mind going to a place that has um, fortified wines that go back that far. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is brandy spirit can be ordered in a lot of different ways. So you can buy some that's either low strength or high strength. The low strength might be around 55, 60% alcohol uh, to uh, high strength, which will get up to, you know, pot still around 80% alcohol. You can get, I think you got 85 is the highest I've ever got out of a straight pot still run. And, um, and, and then you can get it cut early or cut late if you want more heads or you want more tails. So if you want more floral spirits, uh, take some of that heady stuff um, and you can, you can use that to fortify. If you want something that's a little bit darker, a little danker, a little bit, you know, got a little bit more feralness to it, you can use a, a, a tails cut spirit. Um, so you can enhance uh, fortified wine characters. The only thing is, is it takes time for these brandy spirits to integrate because you've got so many different things going on. Instead of just having ethanol that has to go into solution, you've got all these other things. And a lot of these other compounds don't wanna go back in solution. They kinda of wanna sit there and hang out and it takes a long time for them to integrate. So uh, let's taste through some wines and talk about what that means. Okay, so let's do a comparison of the wines. So let's do the 16. The 16, the goal with the 16 was to make a very fruit driven wine. So we used pure SVR, that's pretty much what I had. I used rectified grape spirit from Sunmade Growers. You can buy this from Sunmade. The idea was to focus on the fruit. We ran a little higher SO2 to manage uh, integration initially, hit it with about 200 parts coming out of primary. Um, and now I've just kind of let it come down to about 40 milligrams a liter total. And the idea here was to try and kind of keep the wine in place because in 16, I was planning on bottling a lot of this as Ruby. But as we've seen how good our tawny is selling, we just let everything go to tawny. So I'm kind of letting it come back. But you'll notice that the SO2 is a little lower. And because we had so much up front, it's probably a little bit redder. The 17, on the other hand, is a vastly different creature. We have gone a whole different direction with this. So I did a low strength fat. So this is actually Cabernet Sauvignon that was distilled uh, in a pot still. And what I said is take the heads, keep them, and I want the tails. I want a little bit more tailsy stuff, and I wanted to build in more complexity because this was when it was becoming pretty clear that our tawny port was going to be the style that we were going to go with. So I needed something to, to give some, some character to that 16. And uh, we ran it with pretty low SO2 initially because I was afraid that that uh, fat spirit wouldn't integrate. As a result, uh, it kind of aged a little quicker. So you'll notice the color's down a little bit comparatively. Uh, now it's sitting at about 100 milligrams a liter total. Um, and so we run this, the only reason why we run SO2s at any level in these, and notice that free SO2 isn't on here at all, uh, because free SO2 doesn't matter. We don't care about free SO2. Free SO2 is only there for an antimicrobial. We don't care about it. So all I'm trying to do is keep some level of an antioxidant to help slow down the aging. We won't want it to turn too fast. You gotta make sure it madrasizes at a good rate. So I tend to run about 100 milligrams liter total. And interestingly enough, I have to make that add about once a year. Uh, it fully binds up. Um, so then let's move on to the 2018. Totally different animal. Uh, completely different style of wine right here. This is a low strength floral spirit. And you guys made this. Uh, this was Muscat that we brought in from Greg Schnorr's Vineyard. Uh, made it on skins. Uh, then sent it out and had it distilled by Second Street Distillery. So this is the only fortified that I've ever had that's fortified by spirits out of the same vintage that it was made in. So that is super cool. Uh, this building complexity in a totally different way. Um, don't know how much I like this one. It's really interesting. It's uh, just a whole different animal. And you can just see how spirits between these, these three wines really change things again. So in 2019, we have a high strength pot still again, about 85% alcohol. Uh, this is from Second Street, but what's different about this one is this one was fortified with oak-aged brandy. So the brandy was the brandy that's in your, your glass, the, the brown brandy. Um, so the idea here is to build complexity again. So interestingly enough, I realized I haven't added ESO2 to this, and it's only 16.7% alcohol. So it isn't even done yet. And so it's still got yeast floating in it and other stuff. So i got to put this to bed. I need to get some sulfur in it pretty quick and get that SO2 bumped up because it, it still seems like it's a little bit active. So, um, but I also want to point out that the 19, we were sitting here now in, you know, basically June and, um, and I haven't added anything to this and it's fine. It's sitting on a deck outside and there's got headspace and that's it. 
So if you want to be a real hands-off winemaker and uh, just kind of phone it in, uh, realistically, fortified wines are amazing uh, because it's almost like the, the, the crappier you treat them, the better they come out. Um, so just a, a really uh, fascinating uh, tool. So the polar opposite of making our uh, Sauvignon Blanc, which we do absolutely everything to protect all these aromas and flavors, blah, 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 blah everything else. And then here you go. You got a foot stomped wine that you threw some booze on it and it's delicious. So a whole different animal uh, entirely. And the last wine uh, is kind of personal to me uh, because every single student who has been through the program uh, in some way, shape, or form, has had a hand in making this wine. So every year has been blended together in some small way. I make sure to add a little bit of every year to the barrel every year. And so there's uh, basically the feed of 300 students uh, that have gone on to this wine. Uh, if you notice the kid in the orange shirt, that's Cody Janet. Uh, he's a winemaker for Forgeron now. And uh, I think that's pretty hilarious because he was 18 years old. Uh, I think he just turned 18 when he came into the program. And so um, just kind of good memories uh, and, and has become a really delicious wine. So I'm going to give you the, uh, the recipe on how to make this. So here's the recipe. Pick grapes at 28 to 30 bricks with a TA of around uh, 8 to 10. You can do this with Barbera from Red Mountain. Foot stomp it. Let the wine soak for a few days. If it doesn't start on its own, suck some yeast into it. If some VEA shows up, no biggie. It's okay. Wait until the wine drops maybe 5 or 10 bricks or whatever you feel like, really. Uh, then put on the outfit of your favorite uh, genocidal dic dictator. This step is totally unnecessary. Add spirits, more on this later in class, and bump to roughly 16% uh, alcohol while laughing maniacally due to the fact that you're killing trillions of yeast, hence the genocidal dictator outfit. Consider your audience, however, because that can be tricky. Um, press at some juncture before it tastes like old stims. So whenever you feel like, really, when you get to it. Um, put it in a barrel, uh, then add uh, 100 parts per million SO2. Uh, and then bump alcohol because you're going to miss your fortification no matter what. Uh, no matter how hard you try, you're going to miss it uh, to 18%. Uh, bump up SO2 uh, once a year, maybe, because you feel like it. Leave it outside, do terrible things to the wine, like taste it whenever you want, never top it. Uh, wait patiently in about 10 years, it'll be delicious. Bottle it unfiltered because it's indestructible. Marvel at your awesomeness. Then you wish people would drink more fortified wines. When you can't sell it, you'll end up drinking it all to drown your salty tears of how broke you now are. You'll end up with diabetes. The last four steps are optional, but hey, I was on a roll. Cheers.